uh, it is a great honor to welcome them both. Thank you for coming. I turn it over to you. Thank you, Jacob. All right. Thank you so much, Mark. What a delight to be here with you today. <laughs> and I think you know you're one of my favorite people in all the world. And I read Sex, Death, Enlightenment many years ago when it first came out. And then I met you, what was it, maybe five or six years ago at Blue Spirit in Costa Rica. And I was starstruck. I thought, oh my God, I get to meet Mark Matusik. Uh, your writing has been such an inspiration to so many people and also to me, particularly, you know, the, the plain old raw courage with which you describe your life. Uh, that, that's so inspiring. I look at what you wrote and it empowers me to just be truthful with my light and also my shadow. So it is a great memoir, everyone who's listening. Uh, this is a book you just can't put down. So Mark, I've got some questions uh, for you. And that is, you really talk, it's an amazing journey in the book because you start out this kind of young, skeptical, hard-driven guy working for Andy Warhol and uh, in New York City. And then suddenly you're on a spiritual journey. What happened? How did you how did you get it into the idea of maybe there's something to be learned from a spiritual journey to begin with? Well, Joan, I was very fortunate that somebody came into my life at a seminal moment and took one look at me and said, "You're having a spiritual crisis." <laughs> You know, I knew I knew that I was not happy in my life, that the job I was doing was very empty to me. Uh, many of my friends were getting sick and dying. And I was I was going through a really hard time, but I didn't put it into a spiritual context because I had grown up in an agnostic Jewish a, a, a atheist household. And I had no I had no, uh, you know, no uh, real way of thinking about spirituality. So I was very lucky that that this person helped me and gave me the courage to leave my job, go to India, start to look inward, uh, do meditation, and address the questions that I had been avoiding for my whole life, which is, what is this world? Who am I? What am I doing here? And is there something beyond the apparent world? You know, is there something beyond the apparent uh, dimension that connects us uh, and and is a core uh, a core identity. So that's 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 in a nutshell how how it started for me. Well, that I mean that was brings me back to the AIDS epidemic. Uh, you know, in the early eighties, Mark, I was running a mind body clinic. For at that point, it was pretty much all young guys with AIDS back in Boston. And that, I, I remember that time it was, you know, it was such a difficult, crazy time. In the beginning, we didn't even know what caused AIDS. The HIV virus hadn't been found yet. And I witnessed myself, so many of the um, wonderful young men who came to the clinic suddenly saying, I wonder if there's anything other than this physical body. Uh, and it's, I mean, it was a time I think of just terrible suffering and also a time of awakening for a lot of people. Um, what, what happened to you as you contemplate mortality? <laughs> was that part of, what opened you up enough to do something huge, to leave a prestigious job and like go off to India 
you yeah. need a lot of motivation. Yes, that was the that was exactly what did it. Nothing more shocking than that would have been powerful enough to to shift me. And it was mortal terror that motivated me for uh, on the path. <laughs> I, I spent after I left my job, I I spent 10 years as a Dharma bum, really traveling around the world, really desperately looking for answers before treatments arrived. Uh, and it was a it was a scary time. It was a it was not a time I'd wish on anybody, but it was a time that saved my life as a spiritual being, because it forced me to look beyond the body. Uh, and when everything is being taken away, uh, you have to you look for what can't be taken away, uh, and that is what happened uh, for me. Uh, and, and of course, that's the power of that's the power of facing your mortality. But, but it, it was, the thing, what I learned, Joan, is you can't stay panicked forever. At a certain point, you have to find a way through. And that's what spiritual practice did for me, is it helped me get through those impossible moments when you, the ground is falling, there's no future. How, how can you breathe through to the next moment? Suddenly, I had a practice for doing that. Uh, and a sense that there was a way of understanding my mind that would reduce the fear and, and change my relationship to my own fear. And thank God I, I, I found that, but it, it's, it's a, it was a hard path. You know, it's, it's, it wasn't something that, that I would want to you know, live through again, but it happens so often that we come to spirituality through our greatest losses, as you know, and, and finally just having, yeah. uh, having our cage shaken up. No kidding. Greatest losses and abject terror for sure. Yeah. And that coming to coming to a point where you can bring yourself back, bring yourself back to the moment to center, look at your mind, not follow the negative stuff that's already there. I think that's a really big part of spiritual growth. What were the practices, Mark, that were most important to you that led you to be able to, to do that, to come back to the moment? Well, well two practices. First, Vipassana meditation, uh, mindfulness meditation, gave me a grounding foundational practice mm -hmm. uh, to come into my body, to calm down, to be present, uh, to watch my mind. Uh, and the other practice for me, which has been my practice throughout my life, has been writing uh, for self-inquiry. You know, since I was a very young child, I've been turning to the page to ask questions and deal with my own confusions and my, and my, and my feelings. And during this time, it was absolutely uh, imperative that I, that I keep writing. And that's eventually what became Sex, Death, Enlightenment, was my trying to find my way through this this maze of fear and confusion uh, through writing and, and examining my inner life and how I had gotten to where I was. So the writing the book was part of what saved me during this time. Yes, no kidding. And you are, you're very fortunate. You lived through a time that most people didn't make it through. Yes. And that's, I mean, that's, it's a, of course, such a, a blessing. But the story of that, um, you know, I look at it from the point of view of mind-body medicine. And I think, well, when somebody really has a purpose, when they really have learned how to become present, it does a lot for the immune system. It does a lot for the basic healing uh, systems of the body. And so as I read it, I thought, my goodness, all that meditation, the self-examination, the spiritual practice, they probably really were important for you to survive. Uh, and I, I mean, I love that. It is really the story of someone who survived during an unspeakably difficult time mark. Mm. Um, were you interested at all back then and just the health value of what you were doing, uh, you know, to keep you, to keep you alive? 
I, I was, although it seemed like it was hopeless. So, you know, people were telling us that, that we were we were doomed. We could sure we could drink raw carrot juice in the morning and we could, you know, have our have our, uh, you know, colonics or whatever it happened to be. Uh, but it really wasn't ultimately going to do any good. So it was more about placebo cheering ourselves up. And that that's what we were told. Um, but I did have a sense of that it, having the intention uh, to do as well as I possibly could motivated me and helped to keep me healthy. And the other thing that helped to keep me healthy was my Russian grandfather's genes who, you know, my, my grandfather <laughs> lived to a hundred, he lived to 103. He, he was basically a tank. And I, by fortune, got his constitution. So I, it's, it's those two things. It's, 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 uh, it's what you're given and it's what you do with it. Yep. I think that's, that's absolutely true. Um, when you bring up your Russian grandfather, I think of scenes from the book that were so riveting of your childhood. I think of that sort of scene when you're actually reflecting on like, what was your mother doing when you were conceived? And I thought, well, that chapter tells me a lot about your childhood. And there was definitely trauma in your childhood. Um, how do you think that trauma informs or affects the spiritual search, Mark? Well, I can only speak, uh, speaking from my experience, uh, it was the wound that really gave rise to everything that matters in my life, you know, from writing to spiritual mm -hmm. practice to how I have relationships. You know, I, my father left when I was four years old. It, he, it was a very traumatic departure. He tried to kidnap me before he left. Uh, I was left in a house with, with four very depressed women. My sister killed herself. It was, it was a really difficult uh, beginning, but it made me a seeker. It, may, it turned me inward. I turned to writing uh, and to asking these kinds of deep questions because I had to. I was really trying to find my way through uh, uh, so much sadness. Uh, for me growing up, Joan, the big question was, what happened here to make everyone so sad? You know, how did everyone get so broken? Mm -hmm. And that question, along with before my sister killed herself, she asked me, uh, how do you live? And that became a real mantra for me too. You know, how do you live? Mm -hmm. How does a person do it? And I've always been, I've always been uh, really fascinated with the question of, of how do, how do we uh, how do we live with what we're given as awake people and find happiness and well-being in the midst of the mess you know that that for me that's really been the core question for me as a as an individual and and as a writer and as a seeker i think that's i mean it's it's such an important question i look at what's going on with us now mark in the midst of a pandemic, um, democracy threatened, people in a state of not being able to see one another. And the, you know, the, the divisiveness is so difficult. And I think, uh, uh, if, <laughs> if we could learn the same lessons you've learned and take that adversity and bring it into self-reflection, what a different world it would be. Um, and I think people, people in difficult times look, they look for answers and they look for answers in spirituality and they look for answers in religion. You know, as, as um, one, one thing for sure that we know is the more uncertain the times the more people look for certainty and often in fundamental religious beliefs uh, that unfortunately uh, many times just close people down instead of looking within, they look to authority without mm -hmm. and adopt very inflexible beliefs. 
Spirituality, however, is very different from religion. Um, how would you define the difference between spirituality and religion? The, the, most base, the most basic difference for me is that spirituality is connective and inclusive and universal, and religion uh, is uh, exclusive and sectarian and based on dogma and an institution. You know, spirituality has no institution. Mysticism has no institution. Religion is a form of social control as much as it's a vehicle for spiritual wisdom. Uh, and when those two, uh, those two motivations get mixed up, you get fundamentalism and you get us versus them tribalism the way we're seeing in the country and in the world today. So much of what's going on has to do with religion, uh, religious differences uh, and, and uh, oppositional dogmas. Uh, spirituality has nothing to do with any of that. Spirituality is looking for the through line and the common core. And, and I've always only been interested yeah. in that. And that's why when I was growing up, I did have a bar mitzvah to satisfy my grandfather, but I had no sense of religion or a dualistic faith it never made any sense to me so i've always been looking for what's the irreducible center that we all share that goes beyond goes beyond yeah, religion so and goes beyond nationality excuse me yeah mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and certainly it you know in the time since you have written the book there's been an increasing interest in the difference between religion and spirituality. The idea being there's a spiritual core in every religious tradition. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, many rivers to the sea, no matter what tradition a person may come from. Uh, when, when they actually begin to experience that irreducible core, that you speak of, the experience is the same, whether you're talking to someone Jewish or Christian or Native American or what have you. Yeah. And the descriptors may be different, but the, you know, the actual felt sense, the lived experience is the same. And if we could all just realize, aha, all rivers do end in the same sea and be able to, to um, you know, to really learn and grow from that, it would be, it would be wonderful. It's one of the visions I hold, but there's a whole movement. It, it has a rather strange name. It's called interspirituality. Mm -hmm. It's not... Uh, you know, it's not show me yours and I'll show you mine. It's like, what, where's the intersection? Where's the spirituality within uh, religions? Right. Right. One of the things that occurred to me, by the way, as I, as I read your book, I thought, well, your first spiritual teacher was Mother Mira. And of course, when I read that, I had to go back and think, who was my first teacher? What did the journey go through? And for me, and I think for a lot of people, you'll study a while for a spiritual with a spiritual teacher, and then you know something will come up, and you know that that stops you, mm -hmm. uh, some difficulty or some darkness that you find or whatever. And the question for me that always comes up is trust. How can I trust this person? So what, what, what made you trust Mother Mirror? What was that like for you as a young seeker that you were really willing to show up and open your heart? Because I witnessed it with my own eyes, something that I couldn't explain. Uh, she wasn't, she gives her darshan in silence. There's no attempt to teach you anything. There's no group that you have to join. She is not a guru. She doesn't want followers. So for me, it was the ideal uh, example of what a spiritual being would be like. 
She's inclusive. Uh, she's non-dogmatic. It's nothing but love that comes through. And much everything really is left up to you. Uh, she, she doesn't want to take your power away from you. She's saying, I am here to demonstrate what a spiritual being looks like. There are many on the planet. And your job uh, is to align yourself with the God within. So these weren't things that I, I, I was told right away. The first thing I saw when I saw her was her giving darshan. And I realized that I had just never seen anything like that activity. Whatever was going on with this person kneeling in front of her and her holding the head, I had never seen anything like it. It seemed like a sacred ritual. Uh, and I shut my eyes and I started having all kinds of, of, of visions, which I had never had before in my life. And these things continued. So what convinced me was my experience, things that I never thought I would feel or see or experience. Uh, the first night I was in her house, Joan, I fell asleep. I slept for 15 hours. I slept all through my dreams. She was appearing in my dreams, tearing me apart like Kali and doing all these incredible things. And I woke up sobbing and I sobbed for a long, mm. long time. And mm. I felt like a lifetime of grief had been released in me. That happened through her presence. She didn't say anything. So you ask what made me trust her was these kinds of experiences. <laughs> they were just undeniable. Yeah, so deeply personal. Uh, what, what an extraordinary thing. And you're a person who really feels very, very deeply and then really reflects on that. And, you know, when where I was also raised in a kind of I think one one agnostic and one atheist Jewish parent, <laughs> and, um, and I had all kinds of ideas about God. When I went to Sunday school as a little kid, my father, who was really agnostic, he was really a nature mystic. I remember sitting in his lap. And he had seen some little booklet that came from school with a, a white guy sitting in a cloud with a long beard. That was the image of God. Mm. And my father could go like this with his fingers so fast that his fingers blurred and it made a buzzing sound. And he would say, okay, I'm an airplane. If God's in a cloud, am I going to go right through God's belly button? And I remember thinking, oh, now there's a thought, what's to prevent that? And, you know, as children, we have some idea of God. It changes as we get older. I know in some circles these days, the word God itself is kind of a dirty word because it brings up a lot of antiquated images. So what's your sense, your image, your... Of, of God, how did it change over the years? What's interesting is that I, I had always thought of myself as an atheist. And when it came down to it, I realized that the word God was the thing that was blocking me. And what I realized at the end of Sex, Death, Enlightenment, for example, is that, uh, is that I'm not an atheist. I'm just not a religious person. <laughs> In fact, I'm the opposite of an atheist. For me, God is the intelligence that we are, that manifests in, in myriad millions and trillions of, of ways. That's God is none other than the consciousness that we're using to communicate right now. I don't see any separation whatsoever. Uh, and, and the word God, I, I, I had to make friends with the word God, because the truth is nothing else yeah. resonates like the word God. Once you get past your judgment, you can speak to anybody and they know what you're talking about. They have their own picture of it, but I can communicate as a writer. It's actually more, it's clearer for me to use the word God than infinite intelligence or, or Buddha nature or you see what I'm saying? So I, I've had to make yeah. friends with the word God, and um, I'm, I'm good with that now. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. See, again, 
you're very brave, you're very creative, it's courageous. Sometimes I use the word God and then I think, oh, people are going to think that I'm a religious fanatic. Mm -hmm. But you're right. Otherwise, it's like a long explanation of the power of the universe, the intelligence that animates everything, the connective sense. Um, and God is certainly a great shortcut uh, that people understand in their own way. Um, yeah, I realized it was it was my own, you know how they talk about internalized homophobia or internalized whatever it is. It was my own internalized cynicism that was getting in the way of my making friends with the with, with a, a simple three, you know, a, a three letter word that 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 says so much. So I've really had to get over it. And I'm, I'm it's, it's much easier now. I'm not I'm not sort of fighting with myself about it. I like that. I'm going to take that with me out of this conversation, Mark. Because, um, you know, you go back to the book and when, when you were young, it was so clear. You know, it was a very cynical time there in New York City. And then on top of cynicism, um, you know, there comes in the spiritual path, I think, a need for a kind of healthy skepticism mm. so that you can back up, reflect, look at your experience. And I know that, I mean, to me, skepticism is a scientific word that's, that's good, um, very different than cynicism. How do you think that skepticism has served you on your spiritual path? enormously because otherwise i wouldn't have been able to believe in my own discoveries if i weren't able to sit back and question them you know someone's told me very early on in the path that doubt is the doubt so long as it's not toxic doubt that that blocks you is actually your friend on the spiritual path mm -hmm. and that doubting mm -hmm. thomas doubting thomas was one of christ's favorite disciples you know for the very reason that he wasn't <laughs> fatuous or gullible or taking it on other people's uh you know advice or he or, or experience he needed to know what it was for himself so i think the doubt is very useful as long as it doesn't as long as it doesn't uh, become resistant to resistance or block your curiosity and your willingness to be surprised or to discover you know it's it, but it, it's it's definitely Absolutely. a it's a um it's a balance you know it is. And you know what it brings up for me? I remember seeing the Broadway play Doubt and, you know, uh, a nun who really doubted was this priest that she worked with molesting kids or not. Um, and we tend to think about faith and doubt as polar opposites. But I think I think it's much more nuanced than that. Uh, how 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 would you look at faith versus doubt, and what's how does skepticism sit as a middle ground there? Hmm. I mean, it depends what you mean by faith. Uh, I'm not a person of faith. I feel like I I lack that gene. If by faith you mean the ability to believe in what you haven't experienced or seen in your own uh, with your own eyes, yeah. I really I really like uh, Tagore's line about faith. He says that faith is the bird that feels the light and sings while the dawn is still dark. That's beautiful. Uh, yes. that's, Isn't that it beautiful? It's beautiful. So that's an openness without credibility or credulity or believing in something for the sake of believing in it. That's the only kind of faith that speaks to me. And the truth is that that kind of faith includes skepticism and doubt. They, they're, they're, they're connected. There's no conflict between them. Absolutely. You know, it's <laughs> synchronicity. 
I came across that Rabindranath Tagore quote for the very first time yesterday. Really? <laughs> and now I hear it again. Can you repeat it again? It's really worth hearing, yeah. especially at this very hard time that we're in as a country. Yeah, he said that faith is the bird that feels the light and sings while the dawn is still dark. I love that. I love that. It, you know, it really touches into what, what, what hope is something, mm. some, something that you really feel inside you that becomes mm. uh, a guide, becomes a light that allows you to function, mm -hmm. uh, which brings me to one more question. And that is, we are in a really difficult time, not just as a country, but as globally, mm -hmm. with climate change, with the rise of populism, um, with a global pandemic, with, you know, political divisiveness in a number of countries. How do you think spiritual practice can help us through this current time of, um, of crisis? whether I hope it's going to be a breakthrough, a global awakening. Right now, we're kind of in breakdown. How yeah. can we help ourselves and each other with spiritual practice? Well, it has to start with doing our own work uh, and, and really taking spiritual self-care and spiritual hygiene seriously. Until we do that, activism is is half-hearted at best so we really need to we need to examine our, our own fears our own rage you know many of my friends on the left are as rageful as as folks on the right are and and we need to start realizing that that in you know mm -hmm. that, that we become the thing that we hate if we're stuck in our own hate so we have to deal with our own hatred. We have to deal with our own resistance uh, and our own uh, spiritual, you know, our, our self-righteousness. The first thing I, I would mm -hmm. say, Joan, it's really about humility in terms, if you're asking what would be the, the thing that could be a leveler that would bring well-being, uh, it would be humility and understanding that nobody has the ultimate answers. Nobody's right. And nobody's better than anyone else because of their beliefs. If we don't start with that bottom line, nothing's going to change. Absolutely. No, that brings to mind one of my very first spiritual teachers. This was a group years and years ago called the Holy Order of Mans that sought mm. to understand the actual spirituality of Jesus before it got turned into dogma to look at what his own experience might have been and search inside ourselves for, okay, what is that experience? Um, how, how do we get there? Mm. And my teacher in that group, a guy by the name of Reverend Chris, <laughs> said something about humility that I've never forgotten. And he was thinking of a battery and how the charge flows, you know, from a negative pole to a positive pole. You have to have a polarity in order to generate an electrical current. Mm. And he said, the way that you generate power, power is one side, humility is the other. And without humility, there cannot be authentic power. And I've taken that really to heart. I think it's a, a kind of great corrective mm. when, <laughs> when those moments of judgment and self-righteousness and, you know, looking at other people and say, oh, this and that, they're ignorant or whatever it may be, that corrective uh, is tremendously important. Yeah. And right now it's, it's difficult for people. I think there is such rage yeah. on both sides yeah. of the political spectrum, trying to overcome that with humility uh, mm -hmm. is something. And I have to say that I'm always looking for that in other people. 
uh, it's, mm. I think it's a very attractive quality, actually, in a human being, <laughs> all human beings, not just politicians. So yeah. um, I think we're probably at about the end of our time for the interview before we segue into Q&A, Mark. So is there anything that you'd really like to say in closing this conversation? Only that the pandemic is giving us an opportunity uh, to make a big step uh, over the over the loss and the uncertainty, the fear, uh, and the difficulty. It's giving us an enormous opportunity to change our lives. Uh, and I, having been through a, a different but similar you know, experience and knowing what can shift when you focus on, uh, when you focus on uncertainty and impermanence. I know what can shift when we do that. And I just want to encourage people to take advantage of this time. Don't turn away. Mm -hmm. You're seeing everything else can fall apart, but there's something that doesn't fall apart. So use this as an opportunity to find that thing in yourself that doesn't change. You know? and that really is the only source of any equanimity or well-being or power to help uh, that, that, we, that we have at our disposal. So, and I do hope that sex, death, enlightenment can help people because it confronts these questions uh, in a very particular, personal, peculiar way, but they're universal questions. Uh, and that's why I'm so glad it's being reissued at this particular moment. It's coming out at just the, the, the right moment. And I have to say that I enjoyed reading it again as much as I did the first time, because of course I'm different. When mm. I, you know, when I first read it, my goodness, I was a lot younger. And it gave me a chance to reflect from a different point in my spiritual journey. And I think it was wonderful that you wrote a, a new preface to it. Mm. Uh, and I found that really important as you look back, you know, at your own development and uh, where you are and position the book in that place. So I hope everybody who's listening will buy the book. And I will say it's a fantastic book for the season of giving. <laughs> You're looking for a nice present. This is really fantastic. And when you give it to your friends, one of the benefits is it leads to, I think, a truly insightful and intimate discussion. Mm. So, mm. all right. I think uh, time for us to hear from people what, what their questions and comments might be, Mark. Sounds great. Thank you so much, Joan. It means a lot to me. You're welcome. You know you're one of my favorite people. <laughs> <laughs> So I pop back onto the call and uh, there's lots of questions. So uh, let me just uh, jump in with one um, from, uh, from Paula for Mark. Uh, can you talk about how the act of writing has been transformative and what kind of writing breaks through the stories we tell ourselves about our life? Yes, Paula, as I was saying to Joan, I've been writing since I was a very young kid and I've used it as a, as a tool for self-discovery and, and self-inquiry. What I've found is that when you tell the deep truth, which is not something that we do on a regular basis uh, in writing, mm -hmm. uh, it gives us enormous insight into our, uh, into our true experience. So writing for me that confronts, um, that confronts the existential uh, dimension is the most interesting. So the question at the center of spiritual life, at the center of memoir writing, of course, is who am I? And so, so whatever addresses that, that deep question will take you uh, to places that you may not have been expecting to go and that you haven't explored yet. So tell the truth and tell the radical truth as much as possible. 
I always say to people, you know, you want to tell the untold story. You want to tell the scary story on the page. That's the opportunity. You don't want to hold back or censor yourself or, or, or play nice. You're here to really reveal what you know. And when you do that, the space uh, that that provides is where the insight comes from, Paula. Thanks. Huh. Actually, I've, I've heard a quote from Hemingway about something like, uh, what does it find that, that they talk about what hurts and they go straight at it, something like that. That's right. That's right. Yeah. When you come against fear or, or, or dread or a sense of danger, that's when you want to keep going forward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In the writing. Um, so uh, Nasrin's ask, asking uh, for each of you, if you can recommend, if there's one book that you would recommend and, and why? Ah, well, I'll throw that to Joan. Well, I would, you know, I love memoir. I think it's, it's so very important. Reading memoir uh, allows me to really reflect on my own journey. So of course I recommend <laughs> Sex, Death, Enlightenment. And a more recent memoir that I thought was absolutely stunning was Tara Westover's yes. Educated. Yes. That was Absolutely. that was really remarkable. And she, I mean, she really did tremendous self-reflection as she went from, you know, a member of a fundamentalist cult where children were really not educated to a highly educated person and had to had to look at everything in her life. It was it was quite a, a stunning book. Yeah, yeah, it really it really is. Someone said to me when I was writing my first memoir that when people read your story, they're not reading about you, they're reading about themselves. Right. <laughs> And that's why I love it too. It, it, it takes you deeper into your own experience when you see what someone else has been willing to reveal or, or, or tackle. Exactly, exactly. Particularly when I see people um, revealing uh, the real raw ongoing difficulties, things that have not yet been resolved. Uh, there's that sense of common humanity and I think it's important because, for example, when you see, oh, this person is still standing, even though they, they had some deeply shameful experience, it allows you to give up some of your shame and get closer to that core that doesn't change. You know, shed, oh, I think shame is a terrible layer of identity. And uh, that's why I really love courageous. <laughs> books. Me too. And how about you, Mark? Do you have a, a favorite book? Well, the book I, I would take to a desert island is Nisa Gadatta <laughs> Maharaja's I Am That. You know, that. That's a book that is an endless source of inspiration and wisdom and clarity and freedom and beauty and humanity. Uh, I, I, you, 10, 10 pages of I am that will last you <laughs> and last you a year. It, it, it's so profound. <laughs> so I, I, I do, I do love that book. Uh, I always have it with me. Um, and the other would be, I'm writing a book about Ralph Waldo Emerson right now. So I would also say the collected works of Ralph Waldo Emerson. You can't do much better than that for spiritual journey and also a personal struggle because he came out of a lot of, in, of insecurity and illness and uh, timidity. And so self-reliance came out of his need to find his own power uh, and it's beautiful, beautiful work. Yeah, you can, you can, you can immerse yourself in that language uh, forever. Good. <clears throat> so I actually, I have a question myself. Um, uh, I'm, I'm 42 and uh, uh, so I, I feel like I've hit mid, mid, midlife, like I know it's happened. Um, and uh, both of you are uh, a little bit older than me. And, uh, and uh, just curious, what, what has uh, age taught you? Like, like the age just itself, the process of aging stages of life? Well, I'll start, but just by saying it gets better. 
it gets better. And my 50s were better than my 40s. My 60s have been better than my 50s. If you measure quality of life uh, according to self-awareness and the ability not mm -hmm. to suffer or to create suffering, um, I have found that it gets better and better. Uh, I did a book years ago with Ram Dass. And one of the things he said to me after he had his stroke and he had lost everything, his body, he couldn't feed himself, he couldn't walk. Uh, he said, everything in life diminishes except wisdom. And that made so much sense to me. And because that is why I'm happier at 64 than I was 10 years ago, because I know more, I understand more. I'm clearer, I've let go of more of my garbage. I'm, I can be more present. So for me, age has been a process of getting, of feeling more um, engaged with my life and, and more self-aware. Absolutely. I, I'd say that's true. I've got a lot of years on you. I just turned 75. And You're for amazing. sure, this is the... <laughs> thank you, darling. This is the best time of my life. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say for me, just like problems, this is not uniquely a female problem, but I think gender-wise, more women than men perhaps spend a lot of time just thinking, does that person like me? Am I good enough? Mm. Um, you know, when they look at me, what do they see? And as you get older, at least for me, a lot of that has dropped away. What you <laughs> what you see is what you get. Mm -hmm. I know I can't please all of the people all of the time. I can't even please some of the people <laughs> some of the time. Uh, and it feels, how can I say it? It feels like I've settled in my own skin. Uh, I think it's been much more of a journey of self-acceptance which has allowed me to really accept other people mm. in, you know, in a different way. I look at other people and uh, look at my kids and see, okay, maybe one is having trouble with a relationship over there. Or there's a job problem. Or I look at somebody I don't know who has a different political opinion, whatever. The way I look at it is we're all exactly on the same journey. And some of us are at a point of more peacefulness, um, more reflection, more wisdom. But, you know, we're all going to get to the same place in the end. So it allows me, I think, to have more love. Um, I think... My, my capacity for the love of self and others has grown a lot in these 75 years. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I would only add one thing, which is that men are just as insecure as women. <laughs> and men, <laughs> men, 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 men care what other people think about us just as much as women. So uh, that, that's something, that's just something to kind of level the playing field. That's a level, or all right. <laughs> so here's here's a question from Shahir, um, for Mark. How did your relationship to romantic love as a gay person change on your spiritual path? And I guess that I mean times have changed a lot too. Well, that's a that's a very good question. Uh, well, first, I needed to re-examine my whole relationship to sexuality. Uh, because I realized that there were certain unhealthy uh, attachment patterns in my life having to do with my own biography that were leading to complications uh, and, and not being as present uh, with, with people in intimate relationship as I, as I might have been. So, for example, I had to go through a period of celibacy. When I came back from India, I decided until I had some sense of what this thing was that was driving me and could be such a you know, such a pain in, in relationship for myself and the other person. You know, I just wasn't going to be intimate with anyone. And it was a great experience for me. It was lasted for about a year. It's not like you suddenly get there and say, okay, now I'm cooked and now I can, uh, but, 
it, it was time to it was time to shift back into it, but I needed to take a break. Uh, I need because I didn't realize how much pressure sexuality puts on us, how it colors the way we interact with people, how we objectify ourselves and other people can do through sexuality. Uh, so I really needed to look at that. And I am for but for me, the real issue was that I had this protection around my own heart that was mm. It was, it was, I get two images, barbed wire and fire. So it was both of those things. It was like, stay away. And so I was wanting the very thing that I was pushing away the hardest and I needed to untangle that knot. And, and I did that through, not only through spiritual practice, but also, also uh, through good psychotherapy. So thank you for that question. <laughs> There's a uh, question from, uh... Uh, I'm not sure if it's, yeah, it's Stephen Siha, or sorry, Silha. Um, so, he, so he's asking about um, those who voted uh, <clears throat> on the very extreme side of things in the election. And um, are there safe spaces or how do we create them uh, for finding common ground? And also he, he adds, uh, thanks to both of you, I've heard so much about you, Mark from Joel Singer and you, Joan, from my dear friend, Charlie Murphy. I'll, 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 I'll give that one to Joan. <laughs> if I knew the answer to that, I would be so happy. And that's a, a, certainly a conversation that's going on in, in so many circles. But I think about, um, you know, my own family. Uh, most of most of my family uh, are, you know, I'll just since you asked the question, Democrats. We have one wing who are Republican, and we all watch different news feeds, believe in different facts, love each other insanely, mm -hmm. but have just decided we cannot communicate. Um, about these things. And it feels, I mean, it's okay. It's spacious enough that we love each other anyhow. But the question of how do we come to build bridges? I mean, we all believe that love is the most important thing. Um, and then it diverges from there. So uh, I, you know, I don't know. Of course, you know, you go to a place like Hollyhock. I have wonderful memories <laughs> of Hollyhock. I remember workshops on World Cafe and, you know, exchanging tables and having deep conversations. But that's fine if people are willing to do that. But many people are not. So how do we overcome the divide? I think by simply being good listeners mm -hmm. and hearing what what goes on in someone else's heart that does things like lead them to act against their own interests what are we listening for what do people need how can we show up for those needs in a way that's open-hearted and non-judgmental but this is, I mean, this is the question of the time. I wish I had more insights. How about you, Mark? It's once again, for me, it's about looking at the conflict within myself, because until I, uh, until I can resolve that and make space for the fact that people with hate, hateful views are not necessarily hateful people, uh, then I'm just going to breed more <laughs> violence in the world. Uh, and, and so it's, it's about, you know, I can I can hate the action and not the actor. I can hate the the way of thinking, but not the person not the person who who does it. And that it's a fine line. It's a subtle difference. But it takes the sort of ad hominem uh, dimension away from it. The sort of character assassination. I hate them. That feeling away. Yeah, when I'm, when I hear you speak, I, it. It makes me sort of reminds me of like when, when you're on social media or hearing about people's views, it all seems so black and white, you know. Yeah. But when you're actually talking to a person, um, you know, there's a person there and there's so much behind uh, 
what we are that you could like really listen to and understand and communicate to. And, and we don't have to agree. I mean, and we never, you know, we, we never will agree. I agree with Joan. There are certain things mm -hmm. that you just don't go there. The person asks, how do you create safe space? Part of it is by not opening doors that you know are going to lead you, you know, lead you to, to aggression or, or, or worse. So that's what we have to do is we have to hold our tongue at a certain point and realize we don't have to convince yeah. one another of anything. Uh, if we can simply learn, like Joan was saying, to listen to each other, there that, that's the only place to start. That is, you know, and I, I like to remind myself that coming together will never mean that everybody has the same set of beliefs. That's not going to happen. No. And in fact, evolution occurs from the tension of opposites when, you know, you have to keep expanding and expanding and learning and rethinking. And so um, we certainly have plenty of tension <laughs> to grow and evolve from. It's beautiful. So I guess we're, we're at time. So um, I just want to say thank you so much to both uh, Mark and Joan. It's been an honor to be able to host you on behalf of Banyan and on behalf of Hollyhock. And uh, thank you all for coming out and be sure to pick up uh, or, or order uh, Mark's book, Sex, Death, Enlightenment. Uh, we also carry all of Joan's books and all of Mark's books at banyan.com. Um, so thank you so much again. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. You're welcome, Mark, and thanks everybody for coming. It was, um, I think, a, a really, for me, fun and deep and a wonderful thing to do right now at this point in time. Me too. Thank you.